um, Dr. Roland Thorpe Jr., who holds appointments, joint appointments in medicine and in neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's an associate professor of health, behavior, and society at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he also serves as the director of program research on men's health at the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions. Dr. Thorpe's research focuses on racial and socioeconomic health disparities, particularly among U.S. men. He received a B.S. from Florida A&M University and earned his M.S. and Ph.D. from Purdue University. Dr. Thorpe is a member of the Advisory Committee on Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome to Dr. Thorpe. Okay, great. So first of all, good morning, and thank you so much for the kind introduction, Stephanie. And I'd like to say thanks uh, for the working group for inviting me to participate in what I think is some timely and relevant and important work um, that that we can have conversations around today. Uh, for the next uh, couple of minutes, I just want to share with you some of my ideas and thoughts around this notion of structural racism and obesity and how housing uh, impacts that. So I want to I like to start off with this quote. This quote, I think, has been so very important um, since I got it from this Atlantic article that's, that's cited here. It's so very important uh, around well, this came out around the COVID time. And I, I really like this quote. It resonates and um, it resonates with me as well as um, I think how it links to start gets us to think about some of the conversations we should have about broader systems um, and also for us to think that for us to know that we don't necessarily need more data. We need to start, there's enough data saying that there's a problem. We need to start moving from that data and start thinking about how to, to uh, fix these disparities that exist. So what I want to do is I wanted to talk about how housing discrimination and, um, and how, well, excuse me, how structural racism impact housing disparities. So we know as well documented that there are stark uh, differences in housing for blacks and whites in the U.S. But what I want to do is, as opposed to go run through that again and stigmatize um, African-Americans or non-Hispanic blacks, I would like to talk about some of the pathways by which this operates. And so then we can think about potentially interrupting, disrupting some of those pathways so that we can move forward and start achieving the equity that Dr. Jones uh, so eloquently discussed earlier. So one of the th one of the three pathways that these housing disparities exist is through physical housing conditioning. And when I say physical housing conditioning, this is in the this is um one well-known physical housing condition is that the um, housing has is lead. And we know that the people who live in, particularly if we live in these despondent, people who living in these despondent houses in these despondent neighborhoods oftentimes have um, some of these houses that were built early on in the 30s and 40s, they still have known to have lead in them. And as we know, lead, Lead's ongoing presence came into the national spotlight in the recent years due to the lead contaminated water in uh, in Flint, Michigan, um, and that continues to be uh, one of the um, key points when we think about physical housing. But in addition to physical housing, another pathway by which these disparities may uh, exist is the housing affordability and instability, and that may impact our health and obesity. In fact, unaffordability of uh, housing impacts. Um, impacts health. So an example is that higher rent burden is linked and is known to be linked to uh, hypertension and poor separated health. Uh, furthermore, paying disproportionately <clears throat> disproportionately higher amounts of income towards housing drains financial resources that otherwise, oftentimes otherwise, can be used for health relevant expenses. And and we know that most of the time that uh, black households tend to have uh, less um, fewer income streams than white households. And at the far end of this spectrum, we have housing affordability. And that often goes in hand with residential instability, which really encompasses a number of housing outcomes, such as uh, uh, being behind on rent or mortgage payments, frequent moves, homelessness, evictions, foreclosures, for example, or these are an overcrowding. And we know black homes are more likely to be damaged and, and black households are more likely to be displaced, particularly one particular example that resonates with me is by natural example, uh, natural disasters is demonstrated uh, by Hurricane Katrina. And then the final uh, area by which uh, housing disparities, what I think really drives these housing disparities, is the role of structural racism as it relates to segregation. 
that how that impacts um, housing disparities. And as we know, you know, uh, segregation has been deemed as a fundamental determinant of health, but there's been few discussions around this permanent, uh, this fundamental determinant of health and how it truly impacts uh, housing as the um, housing in and of itself. But just to remind all of us, uh, segregation does impact health in a um, housing in a in a very meaningful way. Oftentimes, when we think of segregation, we refer to it as this. Um, a differentiation between two or more groups in a, among a geographical area. And these groups can be based on a number of things, age, sex, class, race, and ethnicity. And here I'm talking about the most prominent, I'm talking about resi racial residential segregation here and how that impacts uh, health and how housing is nestled into that. So I want to briefly share with you the pathways linking segregation. I think of it as two pathways that link segregation to health outcomes. And we see segregation of the years past has created this differential access to health support and resources. There's the first pathway is known as resource deprivation. And with this, we see that segregation is oftentimes associated with uh, the less available in these highly segregated areas. We have less available full service restaurants and supermarkets, thereby creating the uh, creating oftentimes these uh, these stores, as you see picture above here, is where you can get shop and get your many people who live in these um, highly segregated areas, which are um, oftentimes overlaid in high uh, concentrated poverty areas, and this is typically the their grocery store, as it may be, it's a corner store. Uh, and then in these highly segregated areas, we typically have lower chances of access to high quality medical care. And then most of the time in these areas, we also have fewer health clinic physicians and pharmacies. The second way in which I think segregation impacts health in the housing is that segregation creates these race differences of health risk profiles of communities in which uh, most of the time African-Americans and minorities live. So in, with regard to risk exposure, most of the time in these highly segregated areas, you know, there's a greater exposure to environmental toxins. I mentioned earlier about the physical housing with lead, uh, paint in those. And then you have these target availability of hazardous products. Typically, as you can see on this picture here, they're targeting uh, these malt liquor beverages and beer, M many of the malt liquor beverages uh, of alcohol. And then in these a highly segregated areas, you'll be exposed to another common thing is that you're exposed to this high concentration of poverty. And that high concentration of poverty tends to lead to high crime, low quality um, housing, and just all in all a more stressful environment. And so when we think about segregation and housing, we know typically now that minority racial segregation uh, in the United States, uh, people distinguishes how people experience America. And so with that, minorities tend to live in geographically distinct communities and whites that definitely impacts their housing. And it's this residential segregation that leads to these differential environmental risk exposures that that are part of a system of uh, structural racism that has been put in place early on. In addition to these risk exposures, there are other discriminatory practices that are that perpetuate a house, namely that of redlining. And when I when I talk about redlining, um, this piece of legislation, um, the Homeowners Act, uh, Loan Act of 1933, this is the piece of legislation that consistently um, initiated redlining. And the objective of that of this act was to help refinance these non-farm home mortgages that were at risk of exposure. And particularly, we had houses that were upside mortgages that were upside down, so banks. Uh, issued 15-year um, amortized home mortgage to loan owners. But the problem is they were low interest, federally backed loans that would reduce the payment down to 20% of the price of the home. But black Americans were systematically denied uh, from these low interest, uh, from getting these low interest home loans at, because of this redlining practice where banks just would not provide loans to the areas, certain areas in the city that, consisted of a large proportion of blacks that was largely as a result of residential segregation. And so here I have a slide, I have a picture of uh, a map from my hometown, Macon, Georgia, uh, in 1930, the, um, this uh, Hulk created maps of at least 239 cities. And I, I showed this map, not, 
because yes, because it's my hometown of Mecca, Georgia, but also because it was the, at that time, Mecca, Georgia was considered to be uh, the top uh, city that was, uh, had the largest proportion of uh, uh, hazardous red lines, uh, most red line city in the United States in 1930. And so, as I think Stephanie said earlier, we move forward. This is a more recent map as of, I think, uh, the recent and most recent about three years. And we see much, much hasn't changed in the city of Macon, Georgia, and how that impacts. And we can see the stronghold of the lingering effects of redlining, although the redlining has been outlawed since the Fire Housing Act of 1968, such as residential segregations have been outlawed since uh, 1968 as well. But we still see here with this map of housing, 91% of the redline neighborhoods are still inhabited by mostly minorities, and 73% uh, of these are, um, are neighborhoods with low to moderate income. So while well, whites, on the other hand, are living in neighborhoods that are deemed to be, that remain to be deemed to be the best neighborhoods or the blue neighborhoods, uh, bluely marked neighborhoods on this map, even they were mapped directly onto the bluely ones marked from 1930. So that, that's quite interesting. So how do we bring all this together in, with regard to, um, structural ratios and how this may impact, say, uh, mortality or morbidity, such as obesity. So when we think about, we cannot talk about structural racism nowadays in the, and within the context of uh, COVID-19. So this is a conceptual framework by uh, Berwick's and colleagues that, that show now the impact of, um, of people of color living in these structurally vulnerable neighborhoods and how they uh, may impact uh, chronic disease. And so, for example, when I think about um, walking this conceptual model through as it relates to obesity, then in housing and obesity is you live in a neighborhood that has that's low low resourced or not resourced at all, then you may have some characteristics in the area. You may be poor uh, air, pol uh, air pollution, uh, poor air quality. Then you have this limited walkability. You have uh, food deserts and you think about low access uh, accessibility to healthcare. All of these, when we could think of, we think about all of these, how they may contribute to uh, obesity and the inability to walk or you don't feel safe walking in your neighborhood or, or safe getting out exercising in your in your neighborhood that creates a problem um, for you and it may contribute to stress which also may contribute to obesity and then when we couple this with uh, the, the pandemic, we also see that particularly with, as it relates to housing, uh, people of color um, has an opportunity they're typically living in uh, housings where social distances, multi-generational housing where social distances is not um, it may not be uh, applicable in this sense. So I want to uh, like to shift my conversation in the remaining couple of minutes to talk about a few opportunities that I think that we may see that may be able to move us forward, thinking about from how the, the housing aspect, the disparities in the housing, and how we may be able to move that forward to be able to, to link it to the structural racism and obesity. I put this quote up here because this quote came from a paper by the uh, leadership for the NIMHD in JAMA, I think uh, last year. I like this quote here. Um, the only thing I would change in that quote is I would, uh, I would slightly modify to include health and healthcare of all vulnerable populations. So moving forward, I'll just talk briefly about the opportunities that I think could be done to help us combat this notion of structural racism and obesity. So one of the things I think we could do, we could think about improving housing affordability for people of color, uh, perhaps having some no interest loans for the, for the people of color might be a radical idea that we might, that I think might be able to help uh, start off and then provide people of color with thriving wages, no longer try to give people um, living wages, I think we should start thinking about giving people thriving wages and conversation about what a thriving wave, wage could be, uh, it, it, that we certainly could have that. And I think the other thing that if we want to remove this housing uh, disparities, we want to be able to invest in those communities that has been, that the communities that have been divested in money and resources for a number of years, for decades of years, we want to not only invest in the community, but we want to talk to the people who live in that community to see, to get their input about how those resources could could be used. Oftentimes we don't, well, I, I've never seen a time where we have um, particularly tried to do this 
in, in, in a meaningful way. Um, but I think what we want to do is be able to invest in communities again and talk to individuals who live in those communities to get their input as opposed to just giving them what we think they should have. And finally, think about some cross-sector partnerships to facilitate health equity in housing and communities. I think we have a, I think these problems are at the system level and I think they're inextricably linked but I think we can, we can start thinking about different ways to approach these problems. Thank you.